Good day, everyone. My name is Lars Schernikau, and today I would like to introduce a new peer-reviewed scientific um, research paper that uh, I co-authored together with Professor William Smith from the US. The paper is called Climate Impacts of Fossil Fuels in Today's Energy Systems. Uh, just received peer review and will be published most likely in March 2022. The paper is about the environment. And uh, in fact, it's very positive that the current discussion about climate and, 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 and the environment um, makes us focus on how important it is that we reduce the environmental impact we have. It is unfortunate that this discussion, however, has become much about uh, respect, ethics, scientific integrity, which is often missing in this discussion. The issue of energy transition and decarbonization is actually creating fear and splitting, polarizing the world, pulling us apart, rather than putting us together to see how we can reduce the negative impact our existence has on the environment, including our energy systems. I always like to start with good news and positive news, and, and one of the amazing positive news is how we have been able to improve the crop yield from two tons per hectare to over five tons per hectare just for, for, ye, for wheat, right? India is still behind the average of the world, but has improved dramatically as well. And for maize, you know, it's amazing. We've gone from one ton to over three tons per hectare. So the world has become much better, much more efficient in terms of how we generate our food. And there's many, many reasons for that, um, for why we have that improvement. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, in terms of energy, the paper is about energy. I would like you to understand, first of all, that of our total primary energy, 80% comes from oil, coal, and gas. 80% comes from fossil fuels, and we have to understand what that means. Now, of this energy, right, we are giving, our industries take 20%, transportation takes uh, 20%, and heat and warming ourselves take 20%, and then electricity is roughly 40% of this primary energy. And um, of this electricity, about 60% comes from coal and gas and 10% from nuclear. A lot comes from hydro as well, which is here under other. Keep in mind that of primary energy, wind and solar make up about 3%, and of um, electricity, wind and solar make up about 8%. Hasn't changed much in 2021. In fact, I think it has gone, gone down a little bit. So coal and gas are probably the most important in terms of electricity systems, and that is why the paper discusses those two things. Now. When we talk about global warming and climate change, we have to understand how that works, right? And there are, as you know, um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The biggest, most important greenhouse gas is actually water vapor. That's the biggest, most effective greenhouse gas that keeps us warm. If we didn't have that, it would be quite bad. The second one is uh, CO2, which is what we call a minor greenhouse gas, but it's still a greenhouse gas. Third one is methane, which is a very minor greenhouse gas. And the fourth one is nitrous oxide. Now, the IPCC has introduced what they call a global warming potential, a GWP, a metric, to show how much worse or better one of the greenhouse gases to the other. And in terms of um, methane, you can see that methane over 100 years is about 28 times worse than CO2 for the climate and about 84 times worse than CO2 for the climate as per the IPCC. Uh, so in summary, the global warming potential of methane is much, much higher than CO2. The, the way that greenhouse gases work is actually important. And basically, it, key, it puts a blanket over the earth, we want to call it, that, that, that keeps energy in the earth to keep us warm, right? So it keeps basically, it, it limits the radiation that goes from the earth into space. And this blue curve shows you, right, how much energy would be there if we didn't have any greenhouse gases. We would lose about 394 watts per square meter. Now, the green curve shows you if we had all greenhouse gases, except for CO2, we would, we would keep, retain about 90 watts per square meter to keep us warm, right? Now, luckily we have CO2 and CO2 retains another 30 um, uh, watts per square meter of, uh, of energy in our planet. So um, that CO2, of course, also gives us biomass. Without CO2, we wouldn't have any plants. Without plants, we wouldn't have any animals or life, right? So the CO2 is a greenhouse gas that adds another 30 watts per square meter. Now, if we double the CO2, we come to the red curve, we lose another three watts per square meter. So if you were to double the atmospheric co um, 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 concentration in the atmosphere, sorry, the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, um, double it, we would retain an additional three watts per square meter, so roughly about 1%. Yeah? And just to keep in mind, CO2 is active in this 
wavelength band. So here you have the wavelengths, right? And here you have to have the wattage. And CO2 is active in the 12 to 18 micron wavelength band. And you can see that that band is essentially saturated already. That is why additional CO2 will only have a small impact in terms of warming. Uh, methane is, is active in, in, in this wavelength back, back, back here. It's also saturated. No, it's not saturated, but it's also saturated. And in summary, if we didn't have greenhouse gases, it would be about 33 Kelvin colder than it is today. Now, you can see, you saw before that this wavelength band is much saturated, and that's also the reason that actually as you add additional greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, their global warming potential logarithmically declines, which is not in dispute. So how this works is basically that today we have about 420 ppm of CO2. There's a certain temperature that comes with it, assuming everything else equal. And as we double the CO2, let's say from 420 to 840, right, we would have a certain warming, what we call climate sensitivity, always in clear skies, by the way. And uh, it's quite complicated. The uh, science defines equilibrium climate sensitivity and defines transient climate response. You can read in the paper what that means. Um, but basically, it's different ways of calculating you know, how much warming we would actually have from a doubling of CO2. Now, we have one little disclaimer here. Um, we are using the global warming potential from the IPCC. Um, however, we have reservations about those numbers, especially the 20-year global warming potential. We believe it is, it is not correct, and there's actually much scientific dispute about that. You can read all the links here. You can see um, um, some of the studies. Just to give you a sense about the complexity, let me just um, get myself out here a little bit. Fade myself a little more. Okay. You can see that, interesting enough, how the temperature changes right as you go up into the atmosphere. First it gets colder up to Mount Everest, then it gets warmer again, then it gets colder again. This is about zero degrees, by the way, here's the red line. Right, so it's quite complicated. And interestingly enough, doubling of CO2 will cause temperature decrease in the upper upper atmosphere, right, of about 10 Kelvin. Here you can see the different the different greenhouse gases and their concentration depending on the height. Here is, here is CO2, right? There's water vapor, there's methane, there's ozone, all those things. So it's quite complex, you know, it's not as simple as it seems. Now, going back to the discussion on the climate impacts of fossil fuels, especially coal and gas, it is important to understand that you have to consider what the um, impacts are on our environment from the entire value chain, from production to transportation processing to combustion and recycling, right? And the environmental impacts actually are twofold, right? There are, there are emissions and there are non-emissions. And the non-emissions come from energy input, how efficient you are in using the energy, material input, how efficient you are in material, using materials from the space requirement, effects on animal and plant life, and of course health and safety. So it's quite a complex discussion about what the environmental impact is of our energy systems. Now interesting enough is that today's carbon taxation and today's environmental impact apparently limits entirely on combustion and entirely on CO2 emissions. So the sole focus of carbon taxation is actually on combustion entirely leaving out the entire production value chain, transportation value chain, at least for, in this case, coal and gas, which we um, um, researched in our paper. And the entire methane emissions and CO2 emissions prior combustion are not considered in any carbon taxation um, around the world. Even though today there's much more focus on methane, but it has not been actually compared how much that is. Now we are able to compare that uh, because we have new data, and that new data shows us actually that it's not true that in this case gas emits half the CO2 equivalent that coal does. Before we go there, one more step. We have to keep in mind that when we emit CO2, actually less than half the CO2 is what we call airborne. The remainder actually is taken up by plants, giving us more biomass and by oceans. So every ton of CO2 we emit only 46% of that can actually contribute to global warming. The rest is taken up by nature. It's an important um, 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 in piece of information, which is not disputed. This is for, as per the IPCC on page 89. You can read it yourself. But uh, it's often forgotten in the discussion. Now, on the left side here, you see what the CO2 emissions are. They are reported everywhere in the world, 36 billion tons, right? And they come from, uh, you know, 40% 40 comes from coal. 20 from gas. So basically 60% of all CO2 emissions come from coal and gas. Now, first time 
Now we know that basically we can reduce this number by 54% because effectively airborne only becomes 17 billion tons because we just learned before the rest is taken up by nature, including giving us greener and more biomass. Now, first time ever, the IEA started to summarize the total methane emissions worldwide. And actually, it happens to be 590 million tons, about 600 million tons of methane emissions, which come primarily from, from actually nature, 40%, and man-made 60%, of which 25% from agriculture, 20% from energy. These are the total methane emissions as per the IEA, which are actually conservative. I assume they're much higher, and there's some indications that they're much higher. Now, if you use the global warming potential over 20 years, that would translate to 50 billion tons of CO2 equivalents of methane emissions every year. Taking only anthropogenic, only man-made methane emissions, that's 360 million tons, which adds to 30 billion tons of CO2 equivalents from human existence at a global warming potential of 20 years. And now you can see, you compare the 30 billion to 17 billion, you can see that actually CO2 only makes up 30-35% of the total anthropogenic changes in airborne CO2 equivalent. That's a big piece of information because it's new that has not been discussed before. So, um, in fact, all energy only contributes now a third to CO2 equivalent emissions, including methane and CO2 at 20 years, and coal makes up 22%. It's a very different number. And Again, there is the, 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 the wetlands and others like sort of natural um, emissions of methane which also make a difference. And much of the methane comes from agriculture and actually from waste handling. Now, the interesting discussion comes when you start to put the numbers together. Now, when you use the total CO2 emissions only from combustion only, and you, you divide that by the energy produced from coal versus gas, you get to gas being better than coal for the climate, 1.7 1, 1. times worldwide total global number. We usually is about two times better um, that gas usually emits much more less CO2 during combustion than coal, but a worldwide average is actually about 1.7 as per official IEA and IPCC data. Now, if you just take the methane emissions, you do the same thing, you calculate the CO2 equivalent from methane, you will find out that actually coal is, emits less methane than, uh, than gas, normalized on a per, per energy unit basis, is about 10% on average less methane that coal emits than gas. If you add the two together, you see that gas is now about 30% better than coal on average, right, um, in terms of CO2 equivalent emissions um, worldwide. What's interesting, however, is that the methane emissions from coal come primarily from underground mining. And surface, surface mining doesn't emit significant methane because the methane has already evaporated um, as the coal comes closer to the ground. So only underground mines have any significant methane stored in them. And that comes to the conclusion, actually, surface mine coal is now suddenly 15% better for the climate than the average natural gas. Wow. We've just shown that actually surface mine coal is better for the climate than the average natural gas using IPCC's global warming potential number of 20 years. That's quite big because you can see, I mean, Europe talking about gas, um, you know, making gas green and switching, switching off coal, turning on gas to save the climate. But in fact, as per these numbers, it would not be the case. Um, what's important is that there is what we call a, a, a climate break even, and that climate break even coal of gas is only 2% of methane emissions. So if, if gas only loses 2% more methane, the gas value chain, than coal, you already have climate parity at a 20 year global warming potential. It's by the way, it's about 5, 5.5% at a 100 year global warming potential, also not much. So that means that actually LNG which has a wider value chain and actually loses it more, much more methane, is definitely worse for the climate than coal. And um, keep in mind that methane going into the atmosphere has no positive impact. However, CO2 has a positive impact that comes that basically adds to the greening, and the NASA confirms that, that basically we've had additional greening, which is partially due to additional CO2 in the atmosphere, and because we have set a slight warming, which is also beneficial to the atmosphere. The warming has been confirmed to various, by various peer-reviewed studies. And you remember also your biology class, it takes CO2, water, and sunlight basically to create biomass.
So you have more CO2, you get more biomass. Okay, so I'd like to summarize. Coal and gas account for 60% of electricity generation worldwide. Um, and currently LNG, especially LNG, is favored over coal for climate reasons. CO2 constitutes actually only 35% of total anthropogenic airborne greenhouse gases using uh, uh, IPCC slow warming potential over 20 years. So um, at 100 years makes about 60%. And 40% and of all methane emissions come from natural sources. 25% comes from agriculture. Coal globally, globally thus makes up just about 20% of total greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, at uh, 20 year uh, global warming potential and 30% at 100 year global warming potential. The exact numbers are in the paper, you can read them there. That means that actually coal is better for the climate than LNG on average, and that surface mined coal is better for the climate than all average gas on average. And that is quite a big, big impact. It just takes 2% additional methane lost prior combustion for coal and gas to be on, 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 climate, on climate parity. Um, on average. And one thing is for sure that LNG um, has certainly larger um, methane emissions um, and prior combustion. And the paper um, references various sources where you can see what happens in Australia in terms of the, the gas production and LNG production. It's 5% over 100 years. Now, the next steps actually would be to, to, you know, to, to discuss and actually re look at the greenhouse gas and non-greenhouse gas life cycle impacts on the environment. And those are key for evaluating energy systems. You need to look at the entire value chain. You need to look at the greenhouse gas impact and the non-greenhouse gas impact on the environment for the entire value chain. Then you start to have um, um, proper discussion of what's actually the best, the most optimal path towards the future. Um, we have to recalibrate our energy policy accordingly, right? Carbon taxation and CO2 pricing is incorrect. It's undoubtedly incorrect unless we've made a mistake in our calculations, but we just re received peer review. I don't think we have made any mistakes. Um, we have to communicate this to our economic and policy bodies because we are currently making economical and environmental decisions based on incorrect information by focusing only on CO2 during combustion. But when we compare our entire systems, wind, solar, gas, hydro, nuclear, we have to look at the entire value chain, right? From production and up to recycling. So we need to invest in all reliable and affordable and sustainable ways of producing energy um, in order to eradicate poverty, to enable economic growth and to avoid a global energy shortage, which we are, in my view, um, uh, in significant danger of running into. OK, I'd like to thank you for your time. And um, I hope that you found this helpful and useful. Please download the paper. It's currently available at the SSRN Electronic Journal. If there are any questions, please contact us anytime. Thank you.